to the first episode of Old School Legends of Jiu Jitsu. Myself, Howell, and my partner in crime, Ricardo Amendolia, we're basically going to be looking back at some of the biggest, most influential names of yesteryear. Some of the guys who blazed the trail for generations to come, the guys who were really tearing it up in the competition scene back in the day, who had long lasting influences and really helped Jiu Jitsu arrive where it is today. Ricardo, this is kind of something of a speciality of yours, the Jiu Jitsu history, right? Yeah, I've been following jiu-jitsu history since 1996. You know, I've been a fan of jiu-jitsu, obviously. It's my passion, it's my hobby, it's a little bit of my work as well. I love taking a look at the legends of the sport, telling their stories, analyzing their techniques, and sharing it with the world, especially UFO grappling. All right, so the first subject for this new series is Fernando Terrare. Now, Terrare is one of the most recognizable names in the world of Jiu-Jitsu. I think it's, uh, it's the kind of person, the kind of personality that almost everybody is aware of, but maybe some people don't know too much about his personal background. Ricardo, why don't you kick it off and tell us who is Terrare? Okay, so Fernando Tenere, he was uh, born in the favela, which means slum, in Cantagallo, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I believe it's near Copacabana. They would call that slum is the Hill of Champions. So he's, you know, comes from a very humble beginning. He uh, ended up hooking up with Alejandro Paeva of Alianze back in the day. And Alianze, you know, and Paeva and that team, they sort of saw the potential that Tenere had. And, you know, they saw, like, I think they believe they met him on the streets, you know, calling the cars and doing all sorts of stuff and to kind of get him away from the bad element off the streets and, and utilize his energy you know they brought him into the jiu-jitsu world and really kind of channeled his jiu-jitsu or his, sorry, his energy into jiu-jitsu where he became one of the greatest of all time known not just because of his technical um you know, abilities and what he put on the mat but also as a character he was one of the biggest characters and biggest personas of the sport in the history books that's right. So he started in his mid-teens. Like you said, he was pretty much a street kid running around, getting into mischief. Uh, his parents and his teachers, they had a hard time finding an outlet for that energy. But it turned out that jujitsu was one of the best things for him. He went in and he thrived. In this environment, Gigi found that he had a natural competitor, somebody who wasn't afraid to mix it up on the mats, but also actually proved, out, uh, proved to be very intelligent and very studious and an extremely hard worker. And he even started helping teach the classes when he was even still a kid. Before he even got his blue belt, he would act as an assistant instructor. So it just goes to show that he took to jujitsu at a very early age, and uh, and like I said, you know, it was an opportunity for him to, to to release that energy that he otherwise probably would have found himself getting into even more trouble than he was doing at the time. But um, Ricardo, you said something about you know the, the the environment in which he came up in, but he's he's not the only person to come from that, but he he certainly was one of the first, right? Yeah, he believed he was one of the first people to really kind of open up a, a school, um, you know, teaching the kids in the favela, the slums, and, you know, groom future world champions. You know, guys like Jackson Souza, Alan Finfo actually came and started from his school. And, and a quick little story about that is he won a tournament in Sao Paulo where the, the prize of the tournament was a brand new car, sold the car to open up, you know, to use the proceeds and the money of that to open up the gym in the favelas to teach the kids and kind of give back to the community, you know, taking these kids off the street, keeping them away from the drug dealers and all the violence. And he opened up an academy. Uh, it was a social project, as they call, where he was teaching the kids in Brazil. You know, like I said, Finn Fo, Jackson Souza, tons of other favela style kids coming out of that uh, that era and, you know, came from his roots of Tenere. So as we said, Terrare was a natural competitor, but at the black belt is where he truly showed what he was made of. So he won worlds at every belt color going up through the ranks. But as a black belt, of course, that's where the, the major accomplishments and the accolades come. And he showed that he was one of the best in the world. Isn't that right, Ricardo? Yeah, absolutely. You know, first year at Black Belt, year 2000, uh, he wins, defeating Nino Shembri in the finals. And Nino at that time was regarded as, you know, one of the most innovative and, and greatest jiu-jitsu competitors of that era. Um, I believe you know, that Gracie Mack even called Nino Shembri grappler of the decade leading into that point. So Exactly. You know, I, I remember hearing Romero Jacare say that Nino had one of the most beautiful styles of jiu-jitsu. And, and, and Tenene went in there and just instilled the game plan, beautiful takedowns, guard passing and all 
all sorts of stuff and end up winning the match. Uh, after Worlds, he became world champion again, fought and won the, the World Cup from the CBJGO, a uh, European uh, title further down the road, Brazilian National Championship, Pan Am Championship, and, and not just the titles that he beat, but it's the names of the people that it's he the beat. way that he did it, right? That's yeah. I think what people really vibed with because not only was Terror Ray an incredible competitor and, and you know the, the techniques that he employed, which we'll talk about later, but also the fact that he was a showman, right? When he went onto the mat, he brought an energy that just it, people hadn't really seen before in jujitsu. No, no, not just in energy. In 2004, he brought a, a crew of 200 kids from the favela with big drums and a huge TT flag that would cheer him on. And, you know, when you, if you watch some of those matches, it almost looks like Tenere would move to the sound of the TT drums, which was something I've never experienced before. And I, even since then, I've never seen that in the sport. So you, more than a, a technical innovator and a champion and all these titles, it's the persona, it's the presence, it's the character that was Tenere that also made him just as special. Well, let's talk about the jiu-jitsu then, because we mentioned about the fact that he won all of those major tournaments, but let's talk about some of the guys who he fought and how those matches went. So some of the biggest victories, Ricardo, I think you should kick us off here. Who are the, some of the biggest names that he took out? Yeah, so obviously we mentioned already Nino Chambri in the finals, which was a huge, huge win. Uh, Leo Santos. Leo Santos was Novo Niel's top top lightweight competitor and, and Leo you know was a guy that actually beat Tenere's training partner Leo Vieira so there was a little bit of rivalry with Alianza and Novo Niao at the time so that was a huge win uh, he beat him in the Rio Sao Paulo Friendship Cup I believe um, he also has a huge win over Marcio Pangipano Cruz now this match took place in the 2001 Brazilian National Championships in the Openweight Division put it in perspective there's only a few people that have ever beaten Hodger Gracie Pedro Cruz was one of them. And Tenere swept him ass over T. Kettle. He had an amazing match with him. Probably one of the most exciting matches of, of his career. And well, you know, was, don't forget to mention yeah. the fact that Pejipano outweighed Terre by about 80 to 90 pounds at that time. Yeah, probably more than that. He was about six foot seven, I want to say, almost three hundred pounds, two hundred seventy pounds for sure. Ten yeah, I would... think you're exaggerating a little bit, there, <laughs> but it was definitely there was a big difference. <laughs> he was a monster. He was a monster, but nonetheless, he was a huge, huge man. And like I said, he was one of the only guys that beat Hodger Gracie. But I think one of the one of the guys that that really you know uh, puts a, a stamp in his career. And, you know, he was a guest on the Who's Number One podcast recently, Marcelo Garcia. Tenere has two wins over Marcelo Garcia. One in the finals of the 2003 World Championship where he actually submitted Marcelo with a triangle choke originating from the side control, which was unbelievable. Marcelo at the time was ADCC champion. He was about to win his first World Championship at uh, Black Belt. So that was huge. And then he uh, rematched... That, 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 the way that he hit that triangle, I think it's yeah. been referenced ever since as one of the, the sort of the greatest techniques of that time. It, it was the first time I certainly I'd ever seen anybody do a triangle from that position and not like from the guard, from bottom, like it was usually seen, right? Yeah, he actually did something cool when he got the triangle. He didn't have Marcelo's arm across his body, so it was on the opposite side of the hip. So what he ended up doing was tilting his head and pulling it in. It's it's something really intricate that, that Tenere was, you know, was a special guy and a lot of special technique, but we'll get to that later. Um, he eventually rematched Marcelo in 2004 when Marcelo's star was continuing to rise. He fought him in Japan in a super fight, beat him again. It was so I'm telling you, like guys, this is something that you know his career is something that people still to this day they look at. He did the impossible, beating giants like Pedapano, beating goats like Marcelo Garcia. Tenere did it all. You know, speaking of Marcelo, Marcelo, like you say, he was on the Who's Number One podcast. Let's just give it to Marcelo for a second and let him say in his own words exactly how it was to face Terror Ray. Guys, we we always remember from people that we lose. I, I, I'm not the type of guy that I'm attached attached to the to the winning, you understand? But probably like a, my first year, my first year as, as a black belt, that was the year that I competed against the area four times. And on that first year, I lost all the four times. And he, he was someone that like taught me a lot because was was very intimidated. He, he was... Obviously, like he was still it. Everybody, everybody still consider him like a, one of the best, like a middleweight. But he made me learn so much because, guys, I compete against someone that was like a, I was. I have the intimidation. Someone that was like a kind of like a 
friend and little coach because he was like a, a one of the instructors at five with school and then I have to compete against him. But he was the type of guy, guys, I competed against him four times. All the four times was a different match. I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't stay like a three of those mats on my feet. I didn't stay on my bot on my on my half cut through three of the mats. Every mat I try to do something different. So basically like I I, I I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot like someone that I, I, I never beat. I, I, I learned a lot and I was forced. I was forced to learn it in a really tough way. Really tough way. He was always like a, a very smart guy to, to compete. He never put guard on me. And after everything that happened, you know, he, he stopped competing. One day he looked at me like, a, he looked at me and he told me, yeah, Marcel, nobody know, but I'm never going to pull God on you. <laughs> so. so there it is from Marcelo himself as to how it was to face Terra Ray. But of course, there were many other big names who Terra Ray met in his competition career. And I think some of his most notable matches were against competitors who were significantly bigger than him. Right, Ricardo? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that stands out for sure is his uh, huge performance in the 2004 World Championship, where he entered into the ultra heavyweight division and the open weight division. So he ended up getting third in the open and second in the ultra heavyweight division. And he was only 170 pounds. In that uh, division final, he fought Fabricio Verdum. And, you know, he was. Future he UFC went, heavyweight champion. Yeah, heavyweight champion, one of the best finishers of the sport. Um, he fought Verdum tooth and nail. He, he, you know, super aggressive. They have one of the best stare downs in jiu jitsu history. You gotta see it. And, uh, you know, end up getting, he didn't get submitted. I think he lost by two points. And also in that tournament, Fought Hodger Gracie. Now, let's let's put this in perspective. Ten and a 170 pounds. Hodger Gracie in his prime, or just about to hit his prime. Ten and a opens the match, taking Hodger Gracie down. Let, With just his think about that. Safada takedown, which we'll talk about a little later. But that that was huge, right? Exactly. He took him down. The crowd went nuts. Not only took him down, Hodger tried to recover guard. Ten and a pins his knee, jumps on his back, has a choke locked in. The crowd goes wild. Hodger gets out and defeats Tenere, but man, what a match, you know. And then let's talk about another huge uh, match of his, Ronaldo Jacare. They used to train a little bit together, they're friends, but at that time, Jacare was representing uh, Braza and uh, Fernando Tenere had TT team, so they ended up fighting in the, the 2004 Pan Am Absolute Division. You know, tooth and neck battle. I believe Ronaldo Jacare won by points. It was not a submission, I know that, but it was a very entertaining match, I can tell you. Yeah, it just goes to show that Terra Ray, absolutely fearless competitor. He was one of the guys, one of those lightweight competitors, middleweight competitors, who was entering the absolute division before it was fashionable, right? Because there's a lot of talk of that nowadays as to the, the smaller guys going into the absolutes and, and, and you know testing themselves and showing their things. But just goes to show that it's been happening for a very long time. We should never forget the history. So of course we mentioned the competition results, but one of the things that Terra Ray is best known for were his amazing techniques. So when he went onto the mat, he had a very distinct and a very recognizable game that utilized certain positions that later became very well known in Jiu Jitsu. But at the time, Ricardo, he was doing things that nobody else was doing, is that right? Absolutely. He was, you know, taking giants down at will with ease. He was sweeping giants over his head, you know, like like they were lightweights. He was just doing so many innovative techniques that no one had ever seen. He put together a new style of jiu-jitsu, that favela style jiu-jitsu, if I will, and, and really kind of changed the sport forever. And you know, So what were the main at, things that he was doing? Let's, let's talk a little bit yeah. about what were the main techniques that you would see him utilize on the mat? Okay, so the three major techniques or three areas of technical advancement that I saw today was, uh, you know, A, takedowns, B, his guard, and three, his passing, okay? So takedowns, he had the famous Safada takedown, which was... The Safada uh, takedown, okay, I like <laughs> that name. Maybe we want to describe a little bit about what that is, because I think that the name doesn't really give away much of what, what it looks like, right? Yeah, so the Safada takedown is a variation of the Japanese Kauchi Makikomi, hopefully I don't slaughter that name, but basically it's a takedown. Sal Barrow is awesome at this one, where you go for a drop Sandagi under the arm, and then basically you would use the same side leg to underhook the, their leg falling forward. But what happened with Tenere was he made a variation of it. He would use that in the beginning, people would go to his back, 
So he would do it and use his arm to kind of check their hip and establish an underhook, preventing them from getting to the back. So he made his own little variation. A lot of the judo that Tenede utilized, which you know hadn't really been utilized as well as he was using it, came from his instructor, Alejandro Paeva. Paeva is a really, really well known for his takedowns. But let's let's continue here. Another amazing technique that Tenede had was his drop sandagi. Again, doing it against giants. He would do it and make it look easy. And then towards the later part of his career, uh, you know, he started to utilize a little bit more wrestling, mostly in the duck under scenario. So he would have like a collar and sleeve grip, pull the pull the arm up, duck under, go to the back, usually jumping right on the back with the hooks and going for a choke. Um, the next technical position that I think he's most well known for is his guard. Butterfly, half guard, spider, and the Dele Hiva transitional position, I like to call it. He had... He was, he was well known for having the best butterfly guard. He would actually do so many innovative things like shooting for a double, then sitting back to a butterfly guard and sweeping. But not just the butterfly guard in particular, it's the variations. He was well known for mixing up uh, underhook grips with pant grips and, and a lot of different intricate grips that guys like Coprinia still use to this day. Well, and let's not forget as well, Ricardo, that in this era, at the time that he was really, you know, at his peak of his competition career, the predominant guards that you would see tended to be half guard, close guard. You didn't necessarily see so much of the open guard techniques that are so common now, right? No, you didn't. You saw a little bit of butterfly guard, but no one did it like he did. Let's be honest, okay? And then, you know, half guard was also one of the strongest positions that he had. He kind of abandoned half guard later in his career as he started to get more confident opening his guard up. But, it, you know, his half guard, we have to recognize it. It was solid. It was a little bit different than the Gordo style, like, you know, deep half guard or kind of going underneath. His half guard was a little different in that he was always coming on top. A little bit more like the Lucas Slage style, Perhaps that's where Lucas maybe innovated his Coyote Guard from because Lucas was a TT member, but that's another story. So a lot of innovative techniques. He would use De La Hiva, but more as a transitional position. Really, really well known for a good spider guard as well, using that foot in the bicep and sweeping guys like it was like they were feathers. Okay, so I think for me personally, as a Terra Ray fan, uh, when I go back and I watch those old school matches, one of the things that I think I enjoy seeing the most in those old Terra Ray matches, it's gotta be the passing, right? Because he was one of the most dynamic passers I think that I'd ever seen, and and he really opened the door for a whole new style of guard passing, right? We wanted to break down that a little bit. Yeah, so his his guard passing was something again, absolutely totally new to the sport. You know, it was that favela style jiu-jitsu. It was it was a guard passing where it wasn't directly going through you. It was going around just a little just enough so you would make you try to react and then boom, switch sides and do something else. He was the one that introduced, you know, long step passing top spin, a lot of these leg weaving type maneuvers, a, a lot of that came from Tenet because his main training partner was Eduardo Tellis, somebody that was really hard to pin. So he had to come up with creative ideas to beat Tellis to the scramble. A lot of the back taking sequences that you see today in modern Jiu Jitsu came from Tenet Prior to ten and eight, it was basically a sequence. You take the person down, or you sweep them. You pass the guard. You stabilize side control. But he couldn't do that to Tellus. Tellus was known for his turtle guard, always turtling. Ten and eight would jump to the back. So he utilized the multi-directional passing, leave uh, the leg weaves, the top spin, the long step passing with back takes, and that was something that no one was doing at the time, and still used today by the best in the sport. Well, that's what I was going to say, because certainly when I go back and I, I look at some of those older Terry matches and I look at his guard passing, it is amazing to me how modern it seems. It's like watching a modern day competitor, you know, taken back in time and put in one of those you know, older school tournaments, because the, the, the way that he passes the guard is very recognizable. And it's the kind of thing you see a lot of people doing today. Like you said, the, sort of the, the leg dragging, the leg weaving, the long stepping. Uh, and especially the, the, the precision of the grips as well. I think there was something really phenomenal to watch. But let's talk a little bit about impact because Terra Ray's impact was, of course, massive in the technical sense, but he also had an impact that went further. And I think we can say he really had a long lasting legacy that has gone on through the sport and has been carried by others. Right, Ricardo? 
Yeah, so, you know, you talk about the legacy of Tenere, that's branched on to create some of the super teams and reinforce some of the biggest teams in the sport. You know, Tenere had the TT team, which was him and Telus, but, you know, at one point on those mats, you had the greatest competitors of all time. Let's let's take a look at this real quick. Lucas Lepre, Michael Lange, Abmar Barboza, Hamon Lemos, the Mendez brothers, Andre Galvao, Humans Cabrinha Charles, I mean, you know, Sergio Moraes, you know, Baptista, you know, Leo Nogueira, just tons of the guys that are, are still competing at the highest level today or Hall of Famers were all part of that legendary TT team, which have obviously branched, you know, formed, you know, uh, went into teams like Checkmat, went into Alliance, and also went into Atos. So his legacy really branched off into three of the biggest and best teams in the sport today. And you ask any of those top level competitors, they all they all accredit their success and a lot of their style to Ted and A. I know, you can certainly see it, right? You can see it in the way that they move. You can see certain things that Cabrinha does when he's playing guard. It's very recognizable as something that Terraray was doing way back. You look at Andre Galvao's guard passing, you can certainly see the influence there and the kind of the way that that technique has developed over the years and, and maybe the, you know, the origin of that. But um, I think we should also mention about how, you know, we, we said about how he was 10 to 15 years ahead of the curve technically. And, and certainly his technical skills, they made him, they made him an endearing influence for, for years to come. But it wasn't just on the people that he trained with, right? Yeah, a lot of people that, you know, maybe didn't even train with him just saw some of the unbelievable things that he did at tournaments, you know, battling giants in the open division and just, you know, having such a huge influence. You know, I, I think that that inspired a lot of people, um, you know, transcending into other sports. I know there's a famous story of him, you know, Galvao uh, training Vanderlei Silva and telling Vanderlei Silva of Ted and is going to teach him how to do a butterfly guard sweep one day. So, like, his, his influence becoming one of the greatest stars, it transcended the sport and influenced a lot of people even outside of his, his academies and outside of his team. So he definitely was an influencer. You know, you mentioned as well that the, the Mendez brothers as, as being influenced by, uh, by Terra Ray. Uh, and they've spoken very openly about this, about how when they were teenagers, you know, when they were really young and uh, coming up through the ranks, that, you know, they would sit in the gym for hours and hours just watching VHS tapes, VHS tapes of Terra Ray in action and studying every detail of the way that he passed, every detail of the way that he swept. And so it's incredible, right? That, that, that some of the, the most prominent technical innovators and, and influential members of the current generation directly credit Terra Ray for his influence on them. I think that's phenomenal. But not just on the mats, but off the mats as well. You mentioned a little bit about there, but I think one thing we have to mention is the fact that Terra Ray was probably not the first, but one of the first and certainly one of the most prominent members of the favelas, the, sort of the lower class of Brazilian society to enter into the competition scene because it's well known that certainly the further back you go, jiu-jitsu was a sport for the elite. Now, Brazil has a very um, divided class society and you, know, you have the haves, you have the have-nots. And jiu-jitsu was considered a rich man sport. It was very much for the middle class and above. It was expensive to train. It wasn't just easy to pick up and buy a kimono like it is nowadays, you know? It was an expensive sport and it was a certain barrier for people of a certain socioeconomic background. They just didn't have the means or the wherewithal to go and train jiu-jitsu. Now, of course, there were some other uh, social projects that existed, but you know, People were given a chance occasionally by, you know, much as in the case of Terra Ray with his master, Alexandre Gigi Paiva, that he brought him in and he let him train for free. And I think that Terra Ray going out there and competing and representing that part of society in Brazil opened the door for others to come. And I think one of the things that Terra Ray is most known for as well is that the favela that he comes from, Cantagallo, is surrounded by some of the richest, wealthiest neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro, Ipanema, Leblon, Copacabana. But what Terra did was he opened up a gym, a social project where people could train for free inside the favela at the very top of the hill. And Ricardo, I believe uh, some really notable names got their start in that gym, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Guys like Jackson Souza, guys like uh, Alan Finfu, just a, you know, a whole list of uh, of guys from that area of Copacabana. You know, they, they they got their start training with Tedede. They got their start. You know, he saw something in him the same way that Gigi saw something in Tedede back in the day. So he was able to start the career. And like we said, his lineage keeps going on. Finfu out in Europe teaching. Um, Jackson Souza in Europe now, one of the most accomplished uh, grapplers on the scene. So he. He definitely influenced the sport. He, he, he branched out and gave back to the community. Yeah, I think it's really cool as well that that gym was founded so long ago. It's passed from, you know, hand, through a few different pairs of hands, but it's amazing that around about 20 years later, that gym is still in operation and there are still waves of kids, young kids coming through onto those mats and training nowadays. An endearing legacy for sure. So that takes us up to the modern day. Now, of course, with such an amazing career, you kind of have to wonder, where is Terre now? Well, he's back in Rio de Janeiro. He has a gym, he's teaching. And Ricardo, it's pretty amazing to see that he's actually kind of gone full circle, right? Yeah, he's, he's giving back to the community. He's teaching, he's helping those, you know, who need the help, just like Alexandre Paeva, Gigi Paeva did to him back in the day. You know, once in a while we get to see him compete again and see that glimpse of the old Tenere that we used to love. You know, but uh, you know he's he's definitely still involved in the sport the best he can. And I think now for him it's it's just all about giving back and trying to be in the best shape and you know physically and mentally that he can be in. It's pretty cool to see that even with all the the well publicized difficulties that he had, you know, the drop off from the competition scene and the the lost years of his career, that he's managed to make a pretty solid return. And he's actually he's sought out all over the world to give seminars, to teach, to train people because people recognize, you know, what an amazing influence in jujitsu he is. That they want to learn from him, and also they even go to his gym in Rio de Janeiro to train with the man himself. Now, I'm very lucky to have been there many times to his academy. He has a, a very small, very humble gym. It's a really kind of like small little space. It's just at the bottom of the favela where he lives. But people, like I say, come from all over the world to share those mats with Terre. And it's a very special experience indeed. And I think it just goes to show what an endearing legacy and what an incredible influence this legend of jiu-jitsu, we could definitely call him that, right, Ricardo? Uh, this legend of jiu-jitsu has had on the sport. Absolutely. He'll go down as one of the greatest of all time. And, you know, had things, you know, maybe not gone south a little bit, who knows how, how truly you know, he would have reached his potential, but it doesn't matter. Even though we got to see him only for a short time during that window up to 2004, you know, it was it was something that will always be, you know, remembered and endeared in our sports history forever. Well, there it is. There is this week's Legend of Jiu-Jitsu. We'll have many more coming up in future episodes of the show. Guys, we'll see you next time.